take a step back and look at what your goal is. Is it to produce a physically quality pellet or are we trying to preserve nutrient content? I mean, there's a myriad of goals for companies, right? So in the swine world, are you willing to accept a 60% PDI or do you really need to see that 95% um, and tailoring your production system and, and your operating procedures for that? Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Greiner, your host for today's Swine It podcast. And with me today, I have Caitlin Evans, who is the Technical Director for North America with AV Vista, and Paul Steen, who's the Head of Service, also with AV Vista. Caitlin and Paul, how are you both doing today? Well, Laura, thanks for having us today. Yeah, very good. Thank you for having us and uh, hello to the audience. Yes, well, we're, we're quite excited to have you both on today, uh, certainly to talk about feed processing. I think it'll be a great conversation. Um, but before we get started, I always like to have our speakers give a little bit more introduction about themselves, just in case I don't maybe do a very good job. So we're going to start first with Caitlin. Caitlin, I'll have you go ahead and, and introduce yourself a little bit more. Okay. So as she said, my name is Caitlin Evans. I currently work with AV Vista as the North American um, Technical Support Service Manager. And what that means is I'm responsible for working with both the NIR applications as well as the feed engineering services. So I have a background from NC State in um, poultry nutrition, following with some work at K-State on the feed manufacturing side. Uh, after I finished school, I entered the ranks of the FDA and spent some time there working on the science policy team uh, before joining AB Vista. Very good. Paul, how about you? Hi, uh, so I'm Paul Steen. I'm based in the UK. Um, I've been with AB Vista for about 17, 18 years now. Um, my background is actually in engineering. Um, what do we do um, in services? So with services, we support customers in terms of NIR applications, uh, analytical um, applications, um, determining enzyme activity in feed. And we also have environmental services. So we can also report on greenhouse gas emissions. And we also have the engineering services looking at feed manufacturing technology and also application of enzymes in liquid form. Very good. An animal nutrition technology company offering innovative products and new applications for the swine industry. The combination of AB Vista enzymes, technical services, and nutrition expertise provides the industry with new opportunities to further improve production efficiencies. Fiber is receiving renewed interest due to its influence on the microbiome, and AB Vista has brought together research experts to discuss the industry's knowledge of fiber functionality and to introduce a stimbiotic targeted to improve fiber digestion. To request access, contact NAM at abvista.com. That's N-A-M at abvista.com. Well, it's really exciting to have you both on today. Um, you both have talked a little bit about NIR and, and ingredient analysis, but we're going to flip gears a little bit. Now we're going to talk about pelleting and certainly some of the value that pelleting presents. Uh, currently in the United States, feed costs are extremely high and it typically factors in for us to pellet majority of our diets when feed costs are high. Um, but, you know, in the past, we've kind of been 50-50 as to whether or not we do or don't. And so I think where I want to start is really kind of give us an update on what you're seeing in terms of, of feed pelleting and manufacturing in both the U.S. and the U.K. And so, Caitlin, I'm going to have you start first with just kind of what are you seeing in the field in terms of, of numbers of, you know, what percent of diets are we see being pelleted today? What are some common concerns? And then we'll ask Paul the same of, of what's going on in the UK. Okay. So I think that to answer that question, it, it, we un first need to understand that it's still very um, different depending on what sort of system we're looking at. So in swine, for instance, we see a still about a 50-50 split on pelleting and not pelleting. A lot of that goes back to what equipment is available in the feed mills. You know, it's, it's quite of an investment to purchase pellet mills, boilers, coolers. 
So it really needs to be evaluated from an economic basis on whether it prices in, you know, if we retrofit mills and go back. Um, I think when we look at regionally where pelleting occurs most often, it, it tends to deal with um, ingredient costs. So if we're in the corn belt where corn is maybe less expensive compared to the southeast regions, how do we capture the benefits of being able to grind finer for energy um, availability? We need to pellet typically in those instances. So a lot of times we see a regional shift with pelleting as well. Um, mostly dictated by the ingredients being used and the processing around uh, the use of those. Very good. Paul? Yeah, I think fundamentally in the UK, because of the impact on raw material costs and the competition for some of those raw materials as well because of um, other applications, um, we are seeing um, a decrease in feed production um, in, in general terms. I think um, pelleting, generally we pellet, we pellet most feeds and there are some mash feeds, but they could also be heat treated as well and there's mash for layers. But the challenges are that it, it's the cost. It's the cost um, that is the real big issue here. Uh, the energy costs in combination with the raw material prices is the, is the is big headache at the moment. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. And I think that we're all feeling that energy uh, crunch as, as we speak now. And I think it's only going to continue to get worse. So as we talk through then pelleting, and, and I think Caitlin, you brought it up very well, is that it's generally an economic decision. And it's and Paul mentioned it too, is generally dealing with energy. But one of the challenges we see or continue to hear is, well, I can pellet, but maybe I'm not going to get a very good quality. And so what's the real value of pelleting if I can't maintain that pellet until the time the animal consumes it. And so I think today let's talk more about pellet quality, quality, uh, how we manufacture pellets, some of the questions or concerns around what ingredients we use, how that might influence what we do, and even some of the stability of some of our enzymes through this pelleting process. And so I think um, I'd really like to start with, let's just talk about some, some areas where when we're first concerned about pellet quality, where should we look? What, what should be some common places where in the feed manufacturing process we could potentially influence pellet quality? So I think maybe to back up a second for those maybe less familiar with the pelleting process, we're really talking about two stages here. The first stage being the conditioning process. So the goal of conditioning the mash feed is really to expose the feed to both moisture and temperature. Um, we're conditioning it for it to go through that dye. That second process is the, the true extrusion through the dye to form that consistent pellet that we're, we're you know, visualizing, we're used to, to knowing. Um, so when we talk about the impact of both of those processes, there's, um, it sounds simple, but there's a lot of factors affecting going on behind the scenes of both the conditioning and the physical pelleting process. Um, and I think that's where the science kind of comes in, into play and the understanding between the nutrition side and, and the physical quality. Um, so Paul can probably speak to more on the conditioning and steam process um, and how that can be a, a big factor in the ultimate quality of the feed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, if we think about some of the, the, the parameters that differentiate between feed manufacturing in the UK or in Europe and then in the US as, as well, um, you know, we have the advantage of using wheat um, as our main cereal. But fundamentally, our capacities um, in the UK will be a lot lower than you would be out and out in, in, in the US. Our dye thicknesses will, will be thicker as well. And our conditioning might be a little bit longer as well in terms of residence time. But fundamentally, uh, we are doing it for a number of reasons. And, and I think they are the same. You know, we want to we have, want to have a kill step, a hygienic process uh, in, in, in the pelleting feed. Uh, we want to improve uh, palatability. We want to decrease waste through segregation as well. So these are all attributes that we're all striving towards as well. 
And then we have advantages on better flowability with pellets versus mash. We have increased densities. So we're moving less material or we're moving more volume or less volume for a greater mass as well. Um, and and de-dusting as well. Um, but coming back to the conditioning process, you know, we're, we're prepping the materials for the um, modification of the starch, particularly around the cereals as well. But the conditioning process and the steam in particular are, are a bit of a black art. Um, I'm not sure it's really understood by people that really understand it anyway. It, it's that sort of black art. I think we all know that um, water boils typically at uh, 112 degrees F, um, 100 degrees C. Uh, but in um, in a feed plant, the the water will be produced in a boiler, and the pressure of the boiler will be much higher than atmospheric pressure. So typically, it could be up around about eight bar, and consequently, the boiling point of the water is is, is much is much higher. And there's fundamental reasons why we do that. Um, it's more efficient, uh, is, is one of the things. Um, we can actually transport steam around the plant much simplified. The opposite um, of the temperature increasing, which the water boils, is that the volume decreases. So if we have a higher temperature, we have a smaller volume of steam. So therefore, we can use smaller pipes to distribute the steam around the feed plant. That then gives us challenges at the conditioner because now we don't want to be blasting steam in there. That might be eight bar and the corresponding temperature um, of that is, is, is much higher than the 112 we were talking about earlier on. So we have to get the steam down um, to a suitable pressure. Um, typically around about two bar. Um, it will vary on different applications uh, and the temperature of that will then correspondingly drop. But when we actually reduce the pressure, uh, one of the big aspects that happens is, is the, the volume of the steam will now start to increase. So if we don't compensate for that increase in uh, the volume of the steam by making pipelines bigger, we have a much higher velocity and therefore, the steam is knocked down to what we would term its saturation temperature as it's injected into the, into the conditioner. So the problems that we would see is that it's not giving up its heat or its moisture more readily than we would like it to. So it does have an impact on the, on the conditioning process. So how do we fix that? So if you're already in a mill that currently has a pelleter and we're having problems with getting correct steam pressure. Is it as simple as going in and changing the dimension of the pipes there yeah. or is there something else? Right? <laughs> no, no it, it is as simply that, but I think one of the, the, the big aspects is, is that when people are making a capital investment, putting in a new conditioner, a new pellet press, it's generally because they want to produce more feed. And they very often, in most cases, overlook the, the steam aspects of the installation they just assume the steam is there, it's there in the right volume, it's there in the right quantities, and it's not necessarily that it's the situation. So nobody will go back and increase the diameter of the, of the pipes. They're not fundamentally making those calculations and those assessments. But you're right, it is just a case of rejigging the pipeline. So, you know, we will have what we call a pressure reducing valve. So it takes high pressure steam to, to low pressure steam. Even the position in relation to the inlet of the conditioner is critical as well because we have to give that steam sufficient time to get down to that saturation temperature. So it, it is as simple to redress, but it is overlooked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what would be some common things that we would see if we didn't adjust that steam pressure down? So we're, we're talking about it not giving up its water it being a little bit too hot or significantly hotter than what we want, what would be some outcomes of that if we if we don't correct that problem in the mill? So we, we, we do have some rules of thumb. So what we typically say for a sort of 1% increase in moisture, there would be a corresponding increase in, in temperature of around about 22, 25F. And we, we can actually do these measurements quite easily at the feed plant. It takes a little bit of time, but you know, 
If we take a sample of the mash from the end of the conditioner, we put it in a sealed container, we allow it to, to cool and its moisture will condense into that mash and we can measure the, the moisture in it. We will know the corresponding temperature. We can, we can work out that rule of thumb. So if the steam is not getting down to its saturation temperature and not liberating the moisture, then that ratio will be, will be different. So we'll have a much higher level, much higher temperature um, based on the 1% moisture. So that's some, something we can do and, and measure and, and try and correct it. And then we can play around with the pressures to see if we can actually eradicate some of those issues or go back and modify the pipework. <laughs> so one of the things I hear a lot from people is, and we talked about it just at the brief moment, was uh, the pellets not staying as a pellet until it gets to to the animal. And so we talk a lot about pellet durability and, and pellet durability index. And so maybe let's just briefly have you talk a little bit about what PDI is, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how we adjust that problem or how we fix that PDI. Because I think obviously sometimes when we try to make the, the pellet really strong, we overcook it, we tend to, or we have other problems with it. And so let's first start with what PDI is. And let's talk then about some things that we can do to, to get optimal durability. So for PDI, pellet durability index in, in the UK, as I mentioned earlier on, we're, we're using zero as the main substrate. So we do get good binding characteristics from there. And our PDIs will typically be 95 plus. Um, we're using a Holman tester to do this. It's not it's not like the cancer stays, and I'm sure um, some of the listeners will be aware of both the tests and things. So in the UK, we do tend to have high PDIs. Um, another factor why we have these high PDIs is that we in the UK are probably more focused on the commercial um, manufacturing of feed. So we're selling to, to farms. We're not the integrated model in the US where, you know, quality, you may get away with it a little bit more because it's internal, so to speak. Uh, plus, you're you're using maize as, as the maybe the main serial. But Caitlin can talk about the KSU method and the other applications there are in the US. I guess. Yeah. So um, pellet durability index is pretty commonly uh, used as a measure of quality when it comes to pellets in the US. Uh, we have two methods. We do use the Holman method that Paul mentioned in the UK. Uh, the Holman test is a pneumatic. Um, type of analysis that tumbles or tornadoes the pellets around in a chamber. And it's simply measuring the percentage of pellets that break versus don't break. Um, in contrast, we have the K-State tumble box method, uh, which is also commonly found. And that revolves around um, tumbling the pellets against each other in a chamber. And again, measuring how those pellets break. So depending on which method you're using, you know, the Holman test is known to be a little bit more aggressive. It gives you a lower PDI um, standard compared to the tumble box. We've seen an increase in the use of the Holman in, in North America simply because it is small. It takes up a, a lower amount of space and it can be run in 30 second increments up to 120 seconds, whereas the tumble box takes a full 10 minutes of analysis time. So when I go to feed mills, I typically see a mix depending on on what we're what the company has chosen to go with. The key, I think, is consistency in your method. If you have one feed mill running a tumble box and one feed mill running a Holman for 30 seconds, you should expect to see differences between those results. So I always just say, you know, when you pick your method of analysis, stick with it if you've got multiple facilities running this. Um, and the other key is to pick a method time-wise that emulates your goal. If you're trying to replicate the feed entering the barn, make sure you're selecting a method that, that gives you that result. Because if we're measuring something at the feed mill that doesn't emulate what's in front of the animal, then is it a true representation of the pellet quality? Um, so those would be the, the key considerations that I typically uh, deal with here in the U.S. But we do see both methods today. Very good. Well, Paul's mentioned it a couple times now. He keeps talking about 
the fact that UK uses wheat and how wheat's more optimal for pelleting. And there might be some folks in our listening group that may not understand why wheat versus corn has a better ability to to create a pellet. And so maybe let's just stop there for a moment and talk about that. You know, what qualities of wheat um, allow it to be a better product for for pelleting versus corn? Yeah. So I, I'll start off, I guess, with saying that ingredients in diet formulation play a huge role in the ultimate pelletability of a formula. So things like wheat that have high protein and um, are, are sticky after the conditioning process really lead to improved binding capabilities through the dye, resulting in a stronger pellet. Um, so the nutrient contents of the ingredients being used as well as the variability of ingredients can really impact what your ultimate pellet quality looks like. Um, so that's, that's one big consideration. And in Europe, they have quite a lot of variability in the grains they use and, and the quality standards are, are quite a bit higher than what we would consider in the integrated system in the U S. So yeah, it, it can be a conscious choice by the nutritionist to add things like wheat of higher expense, looking for the benefit on the pellet quality. Mm -hmm. The other thing I've heard nutritionists do would be like a pellet binding unit or an agent to to add in to try to help the process. What's your experience with those? Do those work well? Is that something that, you know, we should really focus on better ingredients to start with? But what's kind of your feel today on how that influences pellet durability? So pellet binders are only as good as the amount of time you're able to condition them. So in the U.S., we're typically under throughput constraints where the U.K. maybe conditions for 60 seconds for hygien hygienic effect. Well, in the U.S., we are typically trying to push feet as fast as we can through the machine. So if we aren't able to moist get moisture and temperature into that mash, even with a pellet binder, you may not see um, as great a difference with its inclusion. But if you are able to capture the value of the pellet binder through conditioning, then then they do seem to improve your pellet durability. Yeah, yeah, no, I I I'd, I'd agree with that as well. But just coming back to the wheat, you know, we were able to gelinize those starches in, in the wheat as well, which gives us just that nice gluey mess to stick together as well. So, but you know. Um, if you're looking for some quick wins uh, in the US, you know, maybe a slightly thicker dye um, can work. Um, slowing down the capacity uh, can, can work. You know, as Caitlin's just mentioned, you will get some more time in, in the conditioner as well from that. You're just allowing the steam and the moisture to get into that mash a little bit better. But they are, yeah, they are quick wins that you, you can look at as well. One of the other challenges we hear a lot with pelleting is really about the the stability of our ingredients. And I'm not talking corn and soybean and so forth at this point, but more of the the additives, if you will. So the enzymes and some of those products that we know the heat could have potential denaturation effects that um, right could reduce their efficacy. And so when we think about this conditioning and, and timing and, and all of this, what are some trips or tips or tricks we should be thinking about when we have products that might be a little bit heat sensitive or even how do we determine if they are heat sensitive? Maybe that's a step in this conversation too. One of the first things uh, you know you consider when you're pelleting is the conditioning temperature. You know, most pellet mills have a conditioning temperature the operator's monitoring. But I think what we've learned recently, probably in the last five years, is that there's a, a real effect at the dye. We call it frictional heat. So whether you're using a thinner dye versus a thicker dye and you're, you have the right moisture for lubrication, you can see uptakes in temperature as the material exits the dye. And I don't think historically we've been very good at measuring that and monitoring that. Um, but I think as we've increased our understanding, we now know that when we apply heat, ing heat liable ingredients like enzymes, it's not just the conditioning temperature that can affect stability. It's also the process of forming the pellet, the compression, and, and the frictional um, forces acting at the dye. So we need to be really cognizant of that and choose dye specs like the LD ratio, the thickness, to 
to counteract and work within the constraints of our ingredients. And the same considerations are for vitamins. You know, some vitamins can't take that frictional um, heat increase at the dye. So just understanding more about what that feed's going through through the process has really given a lot of insight and improvement in the last um, few years on stability. Yeah, yeah. Fr frictional heat at, at the dye is um, is a major impact as as well on on enzyme stability and heat libel additives in in, in general. Um, what I would say about the the incremental heat at the dye is the the lower typically the lower your conditioning temperature, the the more frictional heat you'll see at the dye. So there is a trade off for going slightly higher as well that you will reduce that frictional heat. Um, you know, typical um, conditioning temperatures here in the UK will be somewhere around about the 81 to 85. We don't really typically go much beyond that because we don't need to. Um, with regards to enzymes, if we think that customers are pushing the envelope in terms of stability, you know, we will do stability work under those commercial conditions. So, you know, parts of the services we will offer, we'll go into the customer's implant, we'll hand add um, additives uh, into the formulation, and we'll collect samples at various locations through the process. So it's not just at the end, we'll take mash samples from the mixer to make sure the enzyme is there, first of all. We'll take samples from the end of the conditioner to see what the impact is on conditioning. And then we'll take samples after cooling to see what the impact is from the frictional heat. So we have a, a multi-step process to go through to validate that the enzymes will go through the process before we would commit to it as well with a customer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, I see our time is actually almost up. It's been a very quick few, uh, 25 minutes or so. Um, but I, before we kind of jump over to those main key questions we like to ask all of our speakers, I'd like for each of you just to take a moment and summarize a couple of key points or emphasize a few things that maybe we didn't get a chance to go through or that we've talked about that you feel are really important for customers to understand when they're thinking about pelleting in a feed mill. And so, um, Caitlin, you're first on my screen, so I'll have you maybe give a couple of key takeaways for producers today or nutritionists about pelleting and things they should consider? Um, so I think key takeaways from in applying pelleting in your operation are to take a step back and look at what your goal is. Is it to produce a physically quality pellet or are we trying to preserve nutrient content? I mean, there's a myriad of goals for companies, right? So in the swine world, are you willing to accept a 60% PDI or do you really need to see that 95% um, and tailoring your production system and, and your operating procedures for that? So that can mean lowering your conditioning um, temperature, increasing it if you're trying to get higher pellet quality, slowing throughput, all things you know we, we've talked about throughout this conversation. And each one of those decisions will have an impact on the process and the efficiency and economics behind it. So I really encourage producers and feed manufacturers to take a step back and consider what the goal is before making changes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, for me, it's, it, it's look at some of the key processes, you know, go back and look at your grinding, look at your particle size. Particle size will have an impact on your conditioning, will have an impact on your pellet quality. Go back, have a look at your conditioning. Are you getting that rule of thumb? Or is your mash too dry? Are you getting that transfer of moisture? And it's a simple thing to, to, to do, and it's quite quick, and it'll give you an indication. Uh, but also look at uh, look at the cooling process. Are you cooling correctly? Um, you know, if product is friable, it can also be down to an impact on the, on the, on the cooling as well. So there's three key steps there that I would look at. Particle size, conditioning, moisture transfer, and then the cooling process as well. But challenge yourself. Look at your milling process. Yeah, very good. Thank you both. It's time for our famous three. Ivonic stands for a holistic and sustainable value proposition for livestock production. It combines products and services and leverages digital solutions. 
This is all backed with high value consultancy and deep customer understanding. Ivonic turns science-based efficient nutrition, sustainable healthy nutrition, and precision livestock farming into value for customers and consumers. Well, we like to do this every time we have our speakers on, is we like to ask you all a couple of common questions across the groups, just for some partly curiosity, but also for some fun conversation. The first one we like to ask uh, is really, is there a resource that you would recommend for our listeners today based on the topic that we've talked about? And um, Paul, I'm going to have you go first this time. It's not really a resource. Well, it is a resource and it isn't, but I would always say, you, you know, um, ask, ask people questions and listen to people uh, when they've got something to say to you because you've got an awful lot to learn from other people. Yeah, that's a good one. How about you, Caitlin? So I, I tend to go back to the feed manufacturing um, technology book. I think it's put out a uh, partnership with the AFIA. And, you know, there's been several editions as I've, I've started my career in feed manufacturing. I think we're up to like number six, but it's always a good resource to go back to and check. Um, and in today's world, the universities have a wealth of public, publicly available information, you know. NC State's feed manufacturing um, webpage is great, as well as K-State's grain science. There's a lot of information there intended to help the producer. So I, I find myself going back to those all the time to send to customers. Very good. How about something that's not related to the topic at hand? Have either of you read a good book recently or reading one that you'd recommend to our, our listeners? Um a book I've just re reread, if you like, is uh, Papillon Butterfly. Um, it's about uh, a guy in France who's convicted of uh, a crime and sentenced to life imprisonment in a penal island, uh, and it's about his desire to to escape. So, yeah, it's it's a very good book. Uh, it's a true true story as well. So, I, I'd recommend uh, Papillon Butterfly. Yeah, very good. So. I've just finished um, Where the Crawdads Sing. So that was a movie, I think, last year, uh, and I decided to read the book. Um, very good. And I, I also enjoy a bit of a true crime element. So, uh, yeah, that, that's the most recent read that I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one, too. Well, the last question I like to ask really goes back to someone in your life, or maybe not in your life, but that you're familiar with, and you think about uh, something that has allowed them to be successful. And we're thinking about a trait here. What trait about them do you think has allowed them to be successful? So for me, it, it's an attitude um, and a perception that failure isn't, doesn't exist. You know, from every fail, as long as you're taking away a learning opportunity and you're not repeating the mistake, then it's not a true failure. And I think that has stuck with me all the way through, you know, playing sports in middle school onward. And I, and I use it today in my my job and personal life is perseverance and and learning from your mistakes to improve. So how do you address challenges and improve from them? Very good. Paul? Yeah, yes. Yeah, similar thing to me, actually. Um, you, you know, somebody once told me, we, we don't make mistakes, we just make learning opportunities. Um, so it's a, it was a nice way of telling me off, I think. So. <laughs> um, but it, 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 it's true, you know, we can learn from mistakes as much as we, we learn from anything. So yeah, don't, don't be afraid, I think, fundamentally. Yeah. We're both very good traits for people to have as they continue their work careers and even within their own personal lives. Those are great traits. Well, I do want to thank you both for your time today. Again, this is Caitlin Evans and Paul Steen, both with AB Vista. Thank you again, both of you. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. And anytime you want to talk about feed manufacturing, give us a call. Yeah, thank you. Really enjoyed it.